Hello there, it's the Spanner Man again, ready for another audio commentary for your listening pleasure. Going to do the same tonight, going to do the first episode of the series with Roger Moore. It's called The Talented Husband, so I've got the DVD all queued up, it's the PAL version. When I say one, two, three, play, in a nice slow fashion, we will play the episode, and we'll go through the first episode of The Saint together. Are you ready? Right. One, two, three, play. And here we go. Here comes the ITC thing, I think. Yeah, there it comes, the ITC menu again. Um, The ITC logo, I should say, sorry. And here we are at the Apollo and all London's West End in black and white. Oh yeah, look, Irma um, Ledouche, one to another, the Apollo Theatre, and the curtain comes down on a terrible play. Unenthusiastic applause. Well, that must be some, um, what do they call it, footage from the past, or they've got it <laughs> wrapped up. Oh, no, knock the poor girl over. Nice blonde bombshell there, being drinkled down the front. Here he comes, the sex machine, a Roger Moore. With the suavest quiff you've ever seen. Having a nice glass of wine. Still with mole intact, hadn't had it removed yet. That happened in the 80s, didn't it? The pre-Bond, I think he's older than Connery, but looks about 10 years younger than Connery, of course. <laughs> and he loved, I mean, this is Leslie Charteris, the saint, isn't it? And apparently Charteris didn't like the adaptation. There's a sort of transatlantic Roger Moore accent going on there. The sweat, theatre bars. He's trying to do that sort of other English accent, which is a bit strange. Here comes the producer's wife. (laughs) Madge, uh, yeah, I don't know this actress. Apparently she was a bit of a bouncy lady from the past, but um, didn't have much of a career after this, but she's pretty good in this. I quite liked her. Yeah, she does the role well. And uh, old Roger here, looking suave, and was married to Dorothy Squires, a pop star at the time, (laughs) Welsh woman. Um, soon, soon sort of uh, split out from her and moved on. Oh, there's the old saint thing round his head. Look at those impressive CGI graphics. And here we go into the title screen in black and white. The Saint. Yes, by Leslie Charteris. A lady with a man's name. A man's name with a lady's name. Oh, I don't know. But old Roger, this is his early days. I think he'd been to America and done a few crap movies. I think he'd done Ivanhoe. Uh, I've never really watched that, though. And uh, I love these old, uh, you see, the England of the past. Oh, we've got Derek Farr, Shirley Eaton, and Patricia Rock. Patricia Rock playing the wife of the producer of Derek Farr there. Don't mind Derek Farr, he's a good actor. He's popped up now and again. Here he is, contemplating uh, accidents or murder. What do you reckon? The play failed, no money. I think we're in the studio with big bright lights on him. I just love those setting iron women's hairstyles of the early 60s. They must have used two tonne of air spray on her, I think. <laughs> Stuck her hair up like that. The drink of choice tonight, of course, is a uh, red wine. A very nice a cheeky Beaujolais. Yeah, very nice. Went down lovely. Anyway, I think he, he's a bit suspicious. They're moving out the old uh, sun lounger to get a bit more sun. I think he's he smells uh, an opportunity to get rid of the old girl. Apparently he's done a few misses before. I don't want to ruin it for you all, but... Um, If you're listening along with me, I'm sure you've heard this before, or you've watched this before, I should say. So he's made the excuse to go and get her a sweater. Derek Farr, yeah, I mean, a good English actor. He turned up in Blake 7, um, first season, uh, Orac, playing the creator of Orac. Yes, he was, and uh, did the voice for that episode until um, the next season when they thought it would be cheaper to let the guy who did all the voices do it. You know, the, oh, there he's knocked the plant pot over onto old Madge. She's dead. No, not quite. Didn't quite do it, did you, mate? She's got money. Oh, she looks beautiful with her plant plot embedded. So you look at that. Wouldn't you like to have a house like that? A Tudor house nowadays. Huh? Here's the doctor. Not that doctor. A medical doctor. Mrs. Claren, that's right. He's playing Claren. Yeah. Yeah, Derek Farr, he, he, did, uh, he played Ensor in Blake 7. That's right, the last episode of season one. And then, uh, oh, the guy who did all the voices took over, I can't remember his name, he did Orac, and he did The Liberator, and he did Slave. Tuddenham, Peter Tuddenham, that's right. And he did a few voiceovers in the Ark in Space for the first episode. Gonna cough, sorry. <coughs> I'm not a smoker, but I cough a lot. <laughs> <coughs> Pardon me. 
I like to clear the vocals before a performance, you know. She looks a bit pale, but she's looking herself over. She wants to make herself look good for her husband. Don't think she's going to be any, in any shape for a session of uh, love making because uh, she's a bit bashed by the old plant pot, I think. So here we go. He's, he's saying, oh, no, yeah, guilty. See, he's already got the old guilt complex going on. <laughs> it was my fault, Madge, but I've been killed. In a few weeks, you'll be fine. Now he's going to get the doctor to bugger off and not come round. He doesn't want any visitors, so he can take control of her life. They are Dr. Sprague. <laughs> I like the, the duality. You can see he's suspicious, uh, Mr. Clarenderic Farr here, as the husband. You know, trying to push her away, push this doctor away and be sneaky about it. But um, I think you can see the old doctor's not falling for it either. He's, uh, he can see through this, I think. <laughs> it's a good set, though, isn't it? I mean, this must be a low-grade production. I mean, this is ITC again. You know, I've already done my first Prisoner episode that you can find somewhere along on these files. So look that up if you want another listen to a bit of me warbling on. Here she is making up. She looks a bit grey under the eyes. I know this is black and white, but she looks sort of bags under the eyes. I know this is a good transfer, it's a good DVD transfer. Six weeks she's got to stay there. And then the doctor said two or three, no visitors. I wonder if he's got a wig on there. Looks a bit William Shatner, doesn't it, in Star Trek, the original series. He's got the old makeup covering up the hairline, I think. Yeah. But yeah, she's she's nice. Yeah, I think back in the day I would have uh, asked her back to my room for a couple of uh, glasses of Asti Spamanti and a shag. Um, see, they're having a discussion here. He wants to... Uh, the phone's not been installed yet. They've not had this house long. He's stalling for everything to be installed, I think. Here he's just trying to play her, the old girl. Married her for a money, me thinks. What do we think? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, tomorrow we'll come. Looking at the picture, oh, we need some money. Oh, putting the jewellery away. Mm. Foreshadowing, do we think, for some later times? <laughs> it's going down the bakers. The reason I like doing these old commentaries on these old episodes is they they show England how it used to be in the old filming, even if it's, um, you know, catalogue filming from the past. It just looks great. I love the look of it. Black and white, they they say colour's great, but I like black and white. It really adds some moods, you know. The shadows there of him going out the door, and that's brilliant. <coughs> and him coming down the stairs there. The pictures and that. I mean, this is a set, but it's a good set. It looks solid, doesn't it? No wobbly walls, no Doctor Who sets here. And there's a nice house. Exit. Here she is, Shirley Eaton. Legs, legs, legs. Oh, yes, definitely like a bit of Shirley. As everyone knows, she is the Goldfinger Lady. Sean Connery had the fun of uh, chatting her up and having a play with her and then waking up to a golden lady of her on the bed in uh, Goldfinger. I might do that one day, I don't know, though. It's a long movie. don't know if I could sit through it, I should think. But Shirley Eaton, a big star back then. I think she was in the first Carry On, f second Carry On film, Carry On Nurse. Um, had a big career because she was so gorgeous back in the 50s, uh, 50s and 60s. I think she'd already dropped her first kid here, yeah, and she looks great. Look at the legs and the... Oh, here's Mrs. Jaffa tea. Mrs. Jaffa cake, the new housekeeper. Is there anything slightly suspicious about Mrs. Jaffa tea, we wonder? Even under the um, remastering of the DVD, she it still looks good. I mean, I didn't... I, I had this on VHS to start with. We uh, used to have a really cheap video shop in uh, near where I live. And uh, we used to go down there and buy these tapes for like three quid each. And that's how I got the first episode. So I got into The Saint to start with through the tapes. And of course they started uh, repeating them on Granada Plus, a channel we get over here in England. Oh, there's The Saint's car, Saint 1. It's going to run over Mrs. Jafferty, the new housekeeper, looking after Mrs. Claren. While Mr. Claren, Derek Farr, is away trying to get his business sorted out for the stage. Roger Moore in a bit of a process shot there. Look at that. Look at that. The River Festival's on. He's off to the Ferry Hotel for his... Uh, I wonder if this is the car they use throughout the whole of the Saint. I think it is. I think he got to drive it. He's going to see Mario! Yeah, ST1. I wonder how much they had to pay for that. Or they're using it on private land and they don't have to... Oh, there's the old... I don't know what, what car this is, but... It doesn't do much for me, I've got to say. I know everyone out there is going to be screaming at me saying, Oh, it's the Saints, number one, blah, blah, blah. I don't care. Get lost. Here he is, a Mario. 
And he doesn't even look like Simon Templar. Good to see you. Mario's here. He's just said he's, this is just before his days as a plumber in the uh, Nintendo games. He's lost his curly wig at the moment. He's playing it without his rug. And his uh, plumber equipment's not there. Going to get him a drink. Simon wants some warm beer. Yeah, a pint from the barrel. Blimey, it's been a while since I've had a pint from the barrel. I'm more of a spirit man and a wine man, you might be able to tell. <laughs> oh, he's been in Paris for a month. Excellent. Of course, he's come out because he's a bit suspicious of the Derek Farr character. He's a little bit suspicious that he might be trying... He's found out already that the the first wife died suspiciously, and this is the second wife. Could there be a secret going on here, I wonder? I think, yeah, he's looking for a woman. Aha! Hmm. Banned from the 80s, didn't... I oh, mind Living Daylights, they did a good tune for that. Although, I think Tisto disagrees, he didn't like it, but I thought that was a great song. Bought that on 45, single back in the day. Is Mrs Jafferty? I think there's something strange about Mrs Jafferty, what do you think? And Shirley Eaton again. See, they ruined it, they didn't put her in a nice mini skirt. 60s, they ruined it, didn't they? This could have been perfect for a mini dress and a nice... But she's got a lovely little figure on her. And the rat poison, take it away. <laughs> she's hidden that. Excellent. Maybe she's got something to do with looking after Mrs. Claren as well. Maybe she's a secret agent as well, eh? What do we think? Oh, she's suspicious, looking at the rat poison. She's got it. There's that 60s sort of looking away and looking back and smiling meekly to yourself. She's come over to see Madge, Madge Claren. Mrs Jaffa Cake, are you there? I'll call her Mrs Jaffa Cake from now on, just to be awkward. Look at the old food mixer. There's the old 50s housewife, 60s looking kitchen here. This is what every woman desired back in the 60s, eh? A husband to earn loads of money in a really lovely kitchen. <laughs> I wonder how much the set dressing cost back then. Two Bob? I wonder how much an episode of The Saint cost. Apparently, according to the wiki page, it's supposed to be a bit um, like Robin Hood. Simon Temple is supposed to be a modern-day Robin Hood type character. Um, although he never really robbed the rich. He just looked at, oh, here he is. I think he's related to someone else in this. I uh, can't tell. What do you reckon? Uh, do we keep the mystery going? He's using his suavite to uh, uh, get old uh, Adrian here. Under his belt, in his belt, where he? Yeah, she is nice. Although she's got quite a big gob, like um, Julia Roberts. I mean, I never saw the fascination with Julia Roberts, to be honest. Massive, great gob, tart with a heart, just a tart with a tart, I think. Anyway, so she's not allowed to see any people. Mrs. Jafferty has put the kibosh on that. Mrs. Jafferty won't let anyone see Madge. Madge is being kept upstairs, out of the way. I think the talented husband is getting more talented as we move away, eh? As we move along. Goodbye. He's got plans. See the rat... So she brought the rat poison back to him. Not a good idea. Yeah, hide the glasses. Don't want to look old. Don't want to look old for the husband. Adrian from next door was here. Oh, just some deliveries. Oh, the champagne. See, I wish I had that when I was convalescing from my operation. A nice bit of champagne. Make me feel better. Oh, here he is. Now we're going to find out the extent that he needs some money. He lives off the missus. She's going to write him out. Oh, Taylor's bill. Taylor. 300. Yeah, isn't that a lot? Oh, see, she said the wrong thing here. Isn't that a lot of money? How could you do that? I was living off my wife. I hate living off a woman. I don't know. I wouldn't mind if there's any rich women out there. I don't mind living off you. You can look after me. I'm quite happy for you to do that. You know, it's fine. I don't mind. My tastes are simple, you know, I only want penthouses, I only, I only drink caviar, and I only eat champagne, so, you know, make me happy, make me an offer, get in touch. Well, old Derek's on it here, Mr. Claren. See, is that how you classify me, as a bloody walking bank? That's how I'd classify my wife, if she was rough as fuck. She wouldn't be anything but a walking bank, eh? Ooh, don't think I'm going to get many marriage proposals now. Never mind, eh? See, he just can't stand living off a woman. He wants her to die so he can take all her money and have it. He wants the money. <laughs> See, doesn't it? See, you buy your own fuel, furs, your own jewellery. You even pay for your own engagement ring. See, he's got it sorted, this guy. He knows exactly what to do with the women. 
Why can't you? Yeah, it's our money. See, this is how I'd like women to be with me, but they always took my money. That's why I've ended up making podcasts late at night and stuff like that, because uh, I've got nothing in my life. I'm so depressed. <laughs> Well, old Madge, I think she's slightly suspicious, but we just don't know, do we? Because he keeps sinking all his money into these crappy uh, West End plays. Because he keeps changing these plays, they're always failures. I mean, at the start you heard Simon Templer moaning about how rubbish the play was. And then it sort of closed after three days. And he's going to pop off now to London to sort out another play with... Uh, a writer and have a row with the writer about it but of course he's got to be there because he needs to move his times around because we think he's got uh, evil on his mind I love you Madge very much oh here we go those 60s chased le- this is a sex scene this is a chase 60s sex scene if I weren't married to you I'd die oh blimey don't don't hope for that love <laughs> it could happen <laughs> So yeah, the first two black and white series were massive in America. So the program was ended its run, and then it was uh, turned into color episodes. And they made 120 episodes of this. Only the Avengers made more, apparently. Oh, we're back to the pub, and Simon's having a Bloody Mary or something. I don't know. It's not a warm beer, is it? They changed that in the editing stage. I think Roger Moore. Although I don't know, if Roger Moore was much of a lush, but he used to gamble, apparently, according to the. Uh, commentaries on the uh, Bond uh, movies that he does. He used to bet with Cubby and what's his name? Cubby Broccoli and the other guy. Saltzman. Here he is, St George. He likens himself to St George, eh? <laughs> and oh, right, oh, here she comes. See, they need a mini skirt, not long knee to the knee skirt. And she's got that sort of rigid hair again. I need to give him that sort of... I like, I like a lady to have flowing hair. You know, it's much more sexy as far as I can see. Cookham, that's the name of the place. I wonder if it really exists. I think it does. Does. Diz. I think it does. Right, recently his wife had an accident. Yeah, see. He knows about the first wife. Oh, his other wives died. There you go. So we know that Mr. Claren is up to no good. He's a bit of a dodgy bugger. He thinks he wants to get rid of his wife and take her money. You'd think he'd have amassed quite a fortune, though, with all these... Oh, here comes Mrs. Jafferty. Does she look familiar? Is that shadow casting enough over her face so that the uh, the look of her is not enough? It's, you know, it's amazing. I did not get this when I watched the VHS. I wonder if anyone out there who's not who's new to this ever got it first time. Because I really didn't get this first time. That, um, you know, we'll see soon. I probably, I mean, it's spoilers, but you know who that really is. That's uh, the husband dressed up as the housekeeper doing a bit of a drag act there. Derek Farr dragging up, and I think they've dubbed on that Irish accent. It doesn't sound like Derek Farr doing an Irish accent. It sounds like someone's dubbed over the top, like they did with Darth Vader, of course. Because <laughs> we don't like those Cornish accents. They don't sound too good in our intergalactic space villains, do they? Here she is, Shirley Eaton again. She's the agent looking after Mrs. Claren as well, being sent to look over. And Simon Templer, he's chatting her up, doing well. He's got the suavite, hasn't he, Roger Moore? I mean, he's a dead cert for Bond, really, isn't he? And he didn't have any scruples like Patrick McGoohan about playing Bond, obviously. Even though Roger Moore didn't like hurting the ladies, like he said in the first few Bond movies. He really had to twist Maud Adams' arm behind her back. He didn't like doing that, apparently. And his Bond did turn into a sort of comedic Bond. But then I quite like that Bond, you know. I like that realisation. Can't always be the same, can it? Carl Connery was hard nut, and B was a bit of a... Connery clone with no acting ability and Roger Moore of course did his thing which I like he's sort of the saint again playing the same character but then in his book Roger Moore says he's always been asked to play the sort of hero because of the look typecast because of the way you look you know he's a pretty fella so he's going to be locked into those roles forever the hero you know, Ivanhoe and all that <laughs> so he's here to prevent Mrs. Claren getting killed but he doesn't know how she's going to get killed yet. He's got to work out what um, old uh, Mr. Claren's got in mind for her. So here we go. Oh, dinner's been done. The wine's been served. She's making the perfect house. Oh, he's got hold of her now. Hey. Here we are, those chase sex scenes. Weird direction. They're all facing out, talking to each other. 
This is those apparently you're gay. <laughs> oh dear, the way mean meanings have changed eh, over the years. But she works for the insurance company. She didn't mind leaning across old Rog then, did she? She thinks he's after a Rogering. Oh no, she slipped out. Why oh she's put the put the uh cushions on the floor. I think she's ready for some carpet action. What do you think? Oh, we're getting the history of Mr. Claren now. <laughs> Where the first Mrs. Claren fell off the roof of a Brisbane hotel. 50,000. I mean, that was a lot of money back in 1961, surely. £50,000 would have been something like £500,000 now, I'm sure. At the time of recording, 2013. And then he married the heiress. How many times, he, how much money has he lost? I mean, he must have earned a bloody fortune out of killing these missuses. Surely he's got money, selfish, petulant, spoilt. <laughs> but charming. There you go. <laughs> they moved to New York, and the second wife, she was electrocuted. So he varies his methods. He's got a different MO for each method. Misses a quarter of a million dollars, which is, you know, a couple million now, I'm sure. So, yeah, he keeps coming back and marrying these women. But, you know, the, the plays flop that he invests in. This is what he's losing. So to mount a play in London, oh, he's insured her life for 70000 So again, about 500000 now, if not more. He should be rolling in dough, really. I mean, even the few plays he's produced and paid for shouldn't really flop out that much. That he would lose so much money that it would ruin him and he need to marry again. you think a woman with money would have him checked out first, really, don't you, to be honest. Oh, that looks like a bit of a picture with the lights on in the room. See, they're going to lock her up. He's going to do some work on the new play he's invested in. He's written a very th bad third act, so he's going to go and see the writer. It'll be a tremendous success. God, yeah, right after your five other flops or whatever, you lose all your money, losing all your money on them. Not a complete bitch like the other two, apparently. So, but he just wants the money. But then, like I say, he should have enough money. Look, there's that picture with the lights on in the window. Draped over the window there, a little bit of back paint. Back lot painting, obviously. Oh, smoking on TV, eh, by the 60s. My dad would have loved that. I mean, now you can't smoke anywhere anymore. I mean, I don't smoke myself, but I don't begrudge people who do. They can smoke if they want, surely. He see, he's told Mrs Jaffa T, Mrs Jaffa Cake, that she was, he was married to uh, an heir once. But Grace Claren never had a sister. So they're going to work it out. Oh, here we go. We're looking at the railway line timetables in a book. Now you just use an app on your phone, I'm sure. But back then we had things called timetables in books that we had to follow. So he's going to leave. He's going to get off the next train, come back, and then do his missus, dressed as Mrs. Jafferty, give her some poison. And then hopefully he'll be sorted. He's got to stage a robbery and say that it was Mrs. Jafferty's fault. He's going to blame it on her. Which is really, it's quite a good idea, really. I mean, you make a person up, you use them to commit the murder and blame it on them, and then, of course, you disappear. I think um, they did that in the Poirot, um, 13 at dinner. Uh, not 13 at dinner, three-act tragedy, where they got the guy to dress up as the butler. Might do a Poirot, don't mind a bit of Suchet. A bit of, I like Usenoff as well. He was my first Poirot, very good. Always been a big fan of Peter Usenoff. Not a big fan of his talking programmes, they were pretty boring. I think he thought he was witty and clever, but he was dull as fuck, I think. But a writer and a producer in his own right. Did he a bit on Spartacus, apparently. <laughs> there we go, he's going to go and see the writer. So he's going to... Uh, three o'clock train. So he's out of the way, so he's got his alibi, and meet the guy, and then be back for 8.55. So he's setting up his alibi beautifully. Oh, she doesn't even know about Mrs. Jafferty, does she? I forgot about that. She hasn't been told he's looking after her himself. Well, that's what he's told her. John, don't take so much trouble. He's going to give her this really nice roast dinner thing that looks really tasty. I don't know if rat poison's tasteless or taste... It must be tasteless. It looks fucking horrible. Got this tin of black stuff. <laughs> that is the rat poison. Here we go. He's getting his bag together. He's got his, he's got his dress up as Mrs. Jafferty in it. Here he goes, sort it out, take the bus, uh, take the play and the train timetable. He's got to go to Maidenhead where they use a lot of the external locations. I'll be back in about 45 minutes, there you go. Where they filmed a lot of the carry-on films, might do a carry-on. Yeah, I probably will do. 
Yeah, there they go. He's leaving the house. But, of course, with the stock footage there, he didn't come out. Oh, I like the trousers. Look at the arse on that. Oh, dear Lua. If I was only in a time machine, could get a TARDIS out and go back. Here we go. She's visiting. He's visiting Shirley again. Oh, yes, yes. What a shape. But then I've seen her lately, and of course age never does us any favours, does it? And she's sort of gone gold now, I think. You know, I think that gold paint on gold thing has stuck with her. And it's sort of stuck on her face because she looks like she's painted herself gold in all the recent pictures I've seen of her. I know she's about 80 or something, but... It's like her head got really big and her face went gold. Oh, here comes Mr Templar to uh, crash the party. <laughs> Yeah, he's definitely suspicious. A big lad, isn't he, Roger? Big broad shoulders. I think he did the bodybuilding, um, as I recall, uh, in his book. Um, I can't remember what it's called. It's quite a good autobiography. My word is my bond, something like that, I think it was called. <laughs> I read it, actually, in book form before I got my Kindle. And now, of course, it's Kindle time. Oh, there goes the eyebrow, the people's eyebrow. Before The Rock, there was Simon Templar. There was Roger Moore doing the people's eyebrow. Here we are, back in the studio, the process shop. I do this all the time in the 60s. I love this. It's great, isn't it? <laughs> Some bloke actually had to go out and film the countryside they're driving through. And then to, for the noise, I presume. Look, he's wearing a horrible sort of German hat. Then The feather on it. Well, dearly, he thinks he's... Um, Going to get some lead, a horse on. <laughs> Derek Five, his fluffy hat. Yeah, nice Stet... Uh, what do they call it? A Stetson? I don't know. Train stations, eh? Oh dear, look, no graffiti to be seen. How wonderfully clean it all was in 1961 or 2, whatever this was. Beautiful. God, could we like to go back in time? Go back away from the fugonomics of today? Back into a pleasanter time. Catching the train. Ladies' room. Gentlemen. <laughs> oh, I love it. It's great. Train stations. Oh dear. <laughs> I know it sounds sad, but I just really appreciate the past. It just looks beautiful. It looks so clean. Right, so... Oh, and a steam train as well. Bloody hell, the Hogwarts Express has arrived. And we're off to uh, Maidenhead. As, like I said, they filmed a few uh, carry-on films. Now he's off to the toilet to uh, get into his super disguise. Oh, he's made a note. He's out. He's going to go and meet his mate first, of course, to argue about the play. Roger's having a look at the train, doing a bit of train spotting. Saint train spotting. <laughs> oh, yes. Cigarette again. Everybody smoked. It was healthy then. Oh, I love it. Oh, dear. The old adverts on the walls. The it's just beautiful. Steam train, pollute the atmosphere. So there it is. Oh, this can't be real. There's a couple of guys, I think, either side of this, rocking this backwards and forwards. They did that in their House of Horrors, you know, Doctor Thingy's House of Terror, Terror's, Doctor Terror's House of Horrors. I might do that one day, although the commentary tracks on that are pretty good, so they don't really need me to add anything. <laughs> oh, here we are into the toilet. Now, why is he going to, is he going to turn into Superman? <laughs> oh, and a bus back. And the town of Cookham. Car park. See, this is great. The bus is, oh, here comes Mrs. Jafferty, a.k.a. Mr. Claren. Bending over to sort of give it the hunch look of an old housekeeper. And off he goes, or she, off she, she, he, she, <laughs> goes, to get some fish. This guy, Norman Mitchell, I think he was a famous lot of stuff. Uh, I'm going to buy him a bit of my laptop. The pub, I think that's the pub that, is that the pub that Simon stayed at? I'm not sure. See, you can just stand in the street. Oh, here we go, we're going to get some poison. Would you be having any of that rat poison? That... Strangely overdubbed Irish accent. We've got some of a four ounce or a ten ounce tin. What would you like? Four ounce will do nicely. Three and sixpence. Pre decimalizer. Oh, you had to sign the poison book as well. I think they did that in the Mysterious Affair at Styles. The first Poirot story. I don't think it was the first written, but they did a retrospective story. Agatha Christie did. Mrs. Mary Jafferty. Very Irish. <laughs> yeah, um. 4th of October 1962 this went out. God, so it's... Bloody hell, 40, 50 years ago. I think it stands up, though. I can see and watch these. I know probably a modern audience wouldn't be able to sit through it, but I just love 
all these old classics. A good one. There are some duds, obviously, like it, but they made 60 episodes, whatever. 120, I don't know, but they made loads, so there's bound to be a few duds in there. Here we are, back in the perfect kitchen. Back in that perfect 50s, 60s stereotype kitchen, which I think still looks very nice. Oh, here we go. Is this the big reveal? I think he loves being dressed like that. He's feeling very sexy, dressed up as Norman Bates' his mum. Here he goes. There it comes. See, did you know? A wig for a wig, do we think? Did he take a wig off his wig? Ah, the music's very dangerous now. They know he's coming. He looks evil like that, doesn't he? He looks like he looks like the child catcher in Chee Chee Bang Bang there. <laughs> Time to boil up the rat poison. He's got his gloves on, he don't want to catch none. <laughs> Rubber gloves, I bet they were really they look really thick, didn't they? Oh there we go. Plenty, plenty in. All of it? Bloody hell. Do we need that much rat poison to finish Surely that would taste. God dear. <laughs> Yeah, see, Roger Moore and Shirley Eaton, they both ended up in Bond, of course. God, oh, dear. Silly of me to miss that, wouldn't it? Mm. Yeah, Norman Mitchell, playing the butcher a bit a while ago. He was a good actor, apparently. Apparently. Um, he did a few bits and bobs. Oh, he's taken up the... See, I'd love my dinner served to me. I'm going to get my mum to bring it up to me like that. In the sort of hot plate like they do with Chineses now. When you go into a Chinese restaurant, they put them on the candles to keep it warm. Well, he's got like a silver platter thing, and what's he got there? Look, uh, yeah, underneath to keep it warm. Turn this thing on. That's brilliant. I love that. Be piping hot. It takes 15 minutes to make it hot. So you don't have anything like that now. Your microwave meal that tastes like shit before and after. Mm. She just wants him to hurry back. Bye, Madge. Be seeing ya. It'll be the last time I see you, Madge. <laughs> You won't be missed. <laughs> right, so he's off now, off to London to talk about his play. I'm going to try and get Norman Mitchell up here and see what he did before and after, but they haven't got high hopes at the moment. Doesn't seem to be to be good. everything slowed down because I'm recording. You see, recording this wonderful track for all you lovely people out there who want to listen to my dulcet tones. <laughs> oh, he lived for a while. Those fat guy, Norman Mitchell, but 2001. Yeah. Last of the summer wine, yeah, that ran forever. Crap. You rang all creatures great and small. Maybe I'll do a couple of commentaries on that. I love all creatures great and small. Peter Davison, see, I'm a bit of a sucker for Pete. Like his acting. He was a great Doctor Who, my second favourite Doctor Who after Tom, I think. Uh, Never the Twain, yeah. Are you being served? All those. He was in all those. Only when I laugh. All those classic English. Where's all Gummidge with another Doctor Who, Mister Pertwee? Rent a ghost, yeah, I like. And yes, minister, bloody hell. But yes, he was a rent a ghost. With uh, yeah, that was a weird program from my child. Didn't mind that. Sykes, yeah, Eric Sykes, yeah, recently departed. Carry on, Emmanuel, the crap. Carry on, yeah. I won't do a commentary for that. That was rubbish. The Pink Panther, he did it. God, he's had a massive career. This Norman Mitchell guy. I mean, likely lads. Yeah, whatever happened to the likely lads? I did like that. That was quite good. Reg Varney from on the buses. Loved on the buses. Might do a few of those as well. Some mothers do have them as well. Oh, Mrs. Jafferty. She's back in her gear again. Got to turn back into the guy again now. Back to Claren. Too hot as the old uh, Mrs. Jafferty, I think. It's too hot dressed like that, isn't it? <laughs> Out he comes. Now he's going to go and have a conversation with his playwright. Who, who He just wants to completely rewrite the play and fuck it up, basically. Oh, I love those, look at the old trains rolling about. Everyone went on trains back in the day, didn't they? Now it would be cars for everyone, I think. But you need your alibi, don't you? So you've got to go on the train. <laughs> so he thinks he's already... Oh, there we are, look, Leicester Square. A bit of stock footage again, that's great. When you used to be able to drive around Leicester Square. Look, there's no yellow lines in the parking areas. Oh, grand, you could park wherever you wanted back then. Oh, superb. Here we are, we're talking to the player. I haven't got anything to say. I'm not interested in these actionless plays. He wants to turn it into a play of... Um, you haven't written an action play. You've written a, a play of merit. And of course, no one likes anything of any merit, do they? They want action. Which is probably... I don't know if the guy's got a point. You should have something with some meaning, but... Oh, here she goes. She's going to turn on Din Din. 
be a shame if she throws up and she's not hungry and she never eats this. He's taking a lot to chance here, isn't he, really? Oh, he's in Dad's eye. Oh, God, here we go. I mean, Norman Mitchell, sorry, I'm going back. I, I digress, as usual. I bounce around like a ping-pong ball. But what, what else did Derek Farr do? I know he didn't live much past Blake's. So yeah, 86. He yeah, went on to 86. God, was he in the damn busters? God, Richard the Third, very nice. Oh, we did a lot of Shakespeare in the early eighties. There, those BBC ones that really don't stand up very well anymore. Oh, he played the satellite in Blake Seven Orac as well. <laughs> yeah, the New Avengers. He was in the New Avengers, which was okay. We like uh, Joanna Lumley, very sexy. Still fancy her. Oh, he was in the Avengers as well. God. We still fancy Joanna Lumley up to Abfab, the early Abfab episodes. She was absolutely lovely. Oh, still is alright. I'd bang it. Yeah, we had a long career, but um, not much. I've heard of Adam Adam and there's not much of that left. I think they they saved a few of the episodes of that. But He married a much younger woman, didn't he, the Adam Adam and guy? Or he went out with one. She was in the latest Jonathan Creek, I think, playing the wife. The New Avengers, yeah, he was in a few bits, but not really. Run Pole of the Bailey with Leo, good old Leo McKern. Playing, yeah, we loved him, but yeah, no, he had a long career, but nah, not too much more. Anyway, here we go. Listening to the TV, is he getting back home? I think he's had a row with the playwright. Oh, the saint has sneaked in, so he can see if Madge is still alive or dead. He's got to stop her from eating the uh, rat poison, the pure rat poison that Mr. Claren made for her. <laughs> so he can get the play financed. TV audience laughs, oh my god, hey. <laughs> See, is she dead? Oh no, she's still there. He's going to stop her now. He's got to go in and tell her. She's just about to get poisoned. Looking around the corner. Come on, you know it's the night he's going to do it. He's got his alibi all sorted out. So, here we go. I like this. this, this I want one of these. I'm going to cook my dinner on this thing. Roast lamb with pure rat poison. Yeah, have a little spoonful. Yeah, come on. Put your brain together, Simon. No, don't leave her to it. She'll be dead. Down the stairs, up the stairs, down the stairs. I suppose because this was the first episode, you have to keep it cheap. Make a pilot quite cheap. Oh, there you go, we've got the rat poison. It's right on the top of the bin, conveniently laid on the top so that you can see it. Yeah, look down, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, here we go. He, he doesn't want anything to do with this, this guy here, does he? The playwright. Look, I just want to make a happy play. I want a fun play. I don't want you to make give me a serious message. I think he tells him to bugger off, basically, even though he's investing in his play. Doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? If that's how you feel. <laughs> You're an overblown, un untalented, professional bore. <laughs> it reminds me of a guy I used to work with, this chappy, the playwright guy. There you go. No good, my bill. See you later. <laughs> there we are. There's that same shot we saw at the beginning of the, of the episode, isn't it, there? Yeah. Paddington Main Line Station. I don't think it says that anymore. Steam train. Oh, the 60s. He thinks she's dead now. He's got, oh, here's the doctor. It's lucky that the old doctor that's attending to Madge turned up here. Dr. Sprague. Well, we're perfect for an alibi. He's going to make him take him with him. <laughs> Who played Dr. Sprague? Oh, he's not even there on the cast list. Oh, yeah, there he is. Donald Churchill. Anything to do with Winnie, do we think? Here we go. I mean, you can see the doctor hates this bloke now for telling him to stay away. Um, well, she had no reason to see these building up the alibi here, saying that Mrs. Javity was a bitch. Uh, no one likes you, Mr. Claren. No one likes you. You've alienated yourself from everybody. <laughs> but here we go. He's still doing it. Yep. He's thinking about it. He's going to get a lift home from the doctor, so it's even better. There you go. Yeah, I'm sure you could. He's an arrogant fellow. He knows he's arrogant. He's asking the doctor for a lift back. Mm, there you go. Donald Churchill playing Dr. Sprague. Went up to 91. 
He was in Van der Velk, bloody Van der Velk, the reboot of Van der Velk, that was crap, I didn't like the original. Don't Wait Up, yeah, he was in a few bits and pieces again. A nice varied career in English TV. Uh, quite fun, yeah, Zeppelin. <laughs> Here we go, they're off back to the house. I don't think anyone's driving there, are they? It looked like the car was driving itself, to be honest. Here he is, so he's got his perfect alibi, he's set up, the doctor's covered him for this journey back. The doctor knows he got home for about 9 o'clock, and can confirm that the missus died at about 8, eight o'clock, something like that. Here we go, now he's got to get rid of some of the jewellery and make it look like the place has been ransacked. Here he goes. So this is not a bad plan, I mean you couldn't do it today I don't suppose, but it's quite clever for the for 62. I quite liked it anyway, I quite liked the uh, plot. Oh, here we go. He's going to have a look at the body. Maybe get into some touchy-touchy. Uh, no, naughty Michael. That's no good for 1962. There she is. She's dropped her glasses in a mirror and she's gone face down over the side of the bed. Oh, dear. Better check her pulse, mate. I don't think he's going to. Madge, darling, are you dead? <laughs> Yeah, leave her to it. Oh, make sure it's all gone. Yep, she's gone. He's checked the dinner. The silver stuff. He can sell that. Can play, put, pay for his next play, can't it? <laughs> Madge, you're dead. See, what's he doing here? What's he reaching down for? He's not checking her pulse because she's not dead. But he's picking up the bag and, oh, the grief. The Greek of earning $70,000. Uh, pounds, sorry. The grief. Oh. But like I say, that must be a fortune. And here he goes, down the stairs. Time to get the gloves out, the white snooker gloves. <laughs> He's going to do a bit of ransacking in the kitchen to make it look like Mrs. Jafferty did it. Here he goes. Take the... Uh, oh, yeah, break in. Got to break in, make it look real. Where's he going to break in? He's gone up the stairs again. Uh, so she's pretending to be dead for all this. Taking the jewellery. I think he pulls a ring off her finger. Wouldn't you be able to feel some life, though, or something? Oh, of course, he's got his gloves on. He might be able to feel that she's still warm. <laughs> mm, yeah, go on, take the ring off, you evil git. Here we go. Let's just show you how really evil you are. Uh, take the ring off. Mm, leave the wedding ring off. Take the engagement ring, I think. Did he leave the wedding ring on a finger? Can't tell, really. Down the stairs, he's looking a bit puffed out. All this running up and down. Take 47. There's the old ring phones. I love them. You can still get them. They convert them to digital now if you want. You can still do those sort of funny ring to... There we go. Is this where he's going to get... Boom! Mr. Templar. You've walked right into it. Where are you going, Claren? Back to Brisbane. <laughs> well, I'm glad the M&M guys would like it if I said Brisbane. I don't say it wrong. I want to get in that caravan one day and do a commentary with them boys. That would be fun. Your wives have a habit of dying. Mm, what are you talking about? Oh, there you go. There's Rodine. I thought that was a girl's school. But no, it's a rat poison. Oh, yeah, see. It's no good. I was in London. I've got a, I've got an alibi. Cast iron alibi. But he knows what he's did with the trains. He's read the timetables. <laughs> you got off it. You got on it. <laughs> and came back. What did he do? Jog back down? We'll get back on the train again. <laughs> Here we go. And Dr. Sprague bought him back. Dr. Sprague bought him back. So he's got the perfect alibi. Then who did poison your wife? Mrs. Jaffa Cake. We're going to blame Mrs. Jaffa Cake. Mm. But then, of course, took her without references. I was desperate. But why would an old bag kill his wife? A bit of an oddity, isn't it, really? Hey, oh, you're a very talented husband. You've got to get the title in. They always did on the pilots, didn't they? The title of the episode, they could try to work it in somewhere. She's taken Madge's jewellery. She's off. The jewellery box is broken open. It's empty. So he's calling the police. wants them to come round. So they, uh, they are. He's called her Mrs. Javity. He knows. He's blown the gaff for him. What do you mean? How do you know? How are you so clever, Simon? <laughs> I like Roger Moore here. He's quite hard, you know. He's giving it. He's towering over him. He, yeah, he created an identity for the local tradesmen so that they, he could build this false alibi up. 
But it's brilliant, mythical. There you go, there's the jewellery. Roger's hair moved then, couldn't have had enough hairspray there, I don't think. It's not quite as quiffed, is it? I think he's got more hairspray on than Mrs. Claren. But of course he's going to offer him half the money now, to keep it quiet. Now, Roger was a sort of cool guy, when I did. I loved his Bond, I, lo I think he's a great actor. Can do no wrong for me, old Roger. <laughs> 35 grand, there you go, and take the jewellery. You don't want it. Because Simon's got money somehow, I can't remember how he gets his money. Uh, I think it's in the books, but I don't really care. It's not really important, is it? You pushed her there. Oh, he's getting a confession about the first two wives. Pushed her out the window. Now Madge, yep, he's confessed all three. And here she comes. She's wrote it all down. No such thing as a dictaphone then. Just wrote it down on a pad. We couldn't... I mean, they had dictaphones in Poirot's time in the 20s. Didn't they have them in the 1960s? Couldn't they have some kind of tape recorder? No, it'd just be an iPod recording. That'd have it, wouldn't it? I didn't love the others, but I did love Madge. See, she's still alive, and it's too late. Broken hearts everywhere. She's not dead. See, she did love him, but he's going to jail. <laughs> well, there's no escape for you, mate. Scotland Yard have arrived. What? Well, he's got a Columbo Mac on and everything. This guy is perfect. And Shirley Eaton looking sexy. Oh, how could you? Why? For the money, love. For the money. I wanted the money, darling. <laughs> you just got too old and you spent too many... You asked too many questions. You're no good. Get lost. You should be dead. Don't talk to me. He's going quietly, though. Well, sort of. He's got to, really. He ain't got much choice, has he? Now they're going to leave him all at the scene of the crime. Don't pick up any evidence or anything. Just walk off. Like a sort of three-act play on the stage. This, really, isn't it? With little inserts being thrown in. So she's behind bars as well. Sad, really. Can't do anything about it. He, he's trying to kill you, love. Don't cry. <laughs> Madge. Oh, she did love him. Oh, look, those fake tears. Is that hair gel coming out of her eyes there? I can't tell. <laughs> oh, I loved him so much. Oh, poor old saint. <laughs> oh, so he explained it all to her. And she still loved him, so I wouldn't eat the poison. That's all she could think of, that she loved him. But then, this is good stuff. I love this. I might do some more episodes of the same. I don't know, this one is the best one for me, though. The other ones were okay, but I really did enjoy this first episode. This really hooked me into the series. But nothing other than this one did, really. I, I just like this one best, I think. I feel for old Roger. And there she comes, Shirley Eaton. Time for a threesome, Roger. Yep, let's all do it on the stairs. Let's make Madge feel better. I'll give her a right porking up the steps. <laughs> he's got, has he got shoulder pads on or is he that broad? God, he's massive, isn't he? He did do some bodybuilding old Rog, I think. God. Uh, there goes the eyebrow for the closing scenes. And roll them credits, I think. Yeah, there you go. An ITC production. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I enjoyed that. I love that episode. That's one. Of, that is my favourite episode of The Saint. I might do some more if I find some that I like. But uh, let me know if you enjoyed the commentary. Thank you for listening. Uh, we're going through the credits here, directed by someone I've ever heard of. See, all these people must be well dead by now, I would think. Screenplay by Jack Sanders. There's the cast. Patricia Rock. She was like a rock. Derek Farr. Orac. <laughs> OK, thanks for listening, and I'll hopefully be speaking to you again when I decide to do a movie, when I pick one out that I want to do. Thanks for listening to The Saint. This has been The Spanner Man. Good evening. <laughs>